Hello everybody, thanks for coming. Uh, this, this is a Scottish accent, so set your filters. I had no idea what to do tonight, I don't want to do a, a boring lecture or anything, so I'm just going to open it to questions. But I thought I might read the introduction, because I never do readings. And I can't see tonight, so it could be quite funny. <laughs> You're doing a signing. Yeah, uh, the book's out now, uh, it's, it's called Super Gods. And it's, I guess it's a history of the superhero concept from its, its first appearance in Action Comics number one with Superman. Right through all the, the different transformations that the superhero's gone through to now when, you know, these characters that once were outsider kind of names and, and ideas have progressed right into the mainstream. So it's kind of the book's about why, why now, why are we so interested in superheroes and what might that mean about the, the culture that we live in. And years after the war, with a keen sense of ironic symmetry, the comics arrived as ballast alongside the US service personnel whose missiles threatened my very existence. As early R&B and rock and roll records sailed into Liverpool to inspire the Mersey generation of musicians, so American comics hit the west of Scotland, courtesy of the military industrial complex, to inflame the imaginations and change the lives of lads like me. The superheroes laughed at the atom bomb, Superman could walk on the surface of the sun and barely register a tan. The Hulk's adventures, they were only just beginning. In those fragile hours after a gamma bomb test went wrong in the face of his alter ego, Bruce Banner. In the shadow of cosmic destroyers like Anti-Matter Man or Galactus, the all-powerful bomb seemed provincial in scale. I found on my way into a separate universe tucked inside our own. A place where drama spanning decades and galaxies were played out across the second dimension of newsprint pages. Here, men and women and noble monsters dressed in flags and struck from shadows to make the world a better place. My own world felt better already. I was just beginning to understand something that gave me power over my fears. Before it was a bomb, the bomb was an idea. Superman, however, was a faster better, stronger idea. It's not that I needed Superman to be real. I just needed him to be more real than the idea of the bomb. I mean, that was... And most importantly, the, the fact that people are now dressing up in superhero costumes and fighting crime. So there's, you know, it's quite serious men and women out there who are doing their best dressed in these costumes. So, you know, we've got new medical technologies and bionics and medicines and even our communications technology is making us superhuman, it's connecting us in ways we never had before. So I think that the concept is, is, is the time has come to kind of analyse it a little bit because we're in a time of emergency, you know, the, the, the ecological doom was prophesied, ca catastrophe, you know, everyone's going to die, species will be made extinct. The world's going to end 2012. Well, even whenever the world, we'll be told the world's going to end sometime yeah. and it'll be our fault, you know. So and I, I think the superhero concept has actually risen up and it's coming through, it's like a signal coming through from paper to the screen to real life. And it's, it's trying to tell us there is a future, there is a future of the human project, you know, as I call it in the book, if we actually try and think about why we created superhero characters, it was to inspire us, to give us an idea of what our better selves might be, and then we could imitate those better selves. So I saw it as, uh, it was a great way to tell the history of superheroes, but have some, you know, kind of the way I, I tend to see it as someone who works in, in, in the field, is that it's, it's a really good barometer of the way society changes. You know, comics come out very fast on a quick schedule. And the, the writers and artists are constantly reading the latest magazines and science journals, anything for ideas, because it swallows up so many ideas. So because of that, unlike movies, which take, say, five years to make, or even TV shows, it's long, it's long gestation time. Comics can be done and out in three months, and they really track the culture very well. So I saw them as being the fact that they were emerging into the wider culture seemed worthy of kind of discussion, you know. So the book, the book's about that, and it's also a, a biography of my life in comics and how much and how strangely comics have changed my life. I joined a generation of writers and artists, mostly from a UK working class background, who saw in the Moribond hero universes the potential to create expressive skillful, challenging adult works that could recharge the dry husk of the superhero concept with a new relevance and vitality. 
As a result, stories got smarter. Artwork became more sophisticated, and the superhero began a new lease of life in books that were philosophical, postmodern, and wildly ambitious. The last 20 years have seen startling innovative work from dozens of distinctive and flamboyant talents in the field. The low production costs, pen and ink can conjure scenes that would cost millions of dollars of computer time to recreate on screen, and rapid publication frequency means that in comic books almost anything goes. And how they impact it in your life. Like, I started reading the book, and I love what you did with the first cover of Action Comics number one. <clears throat> you took it apart, literally. Yeah. And there was stuff in there. I was like, wow, I had never thought about that. Like the Chaplin movie mm -hmm. that you mentioned. And it was, I mean, the, that first Action Comics cover, I hadn't really looked at it like that before. To me, it was just a bad drawing from the old days, you know. <laughs> and to suddenly look at it for what it was and, and what it stood for, because nobody had ever seen Superman before. And suddenly there's this image of just a guy with no name, but wearing this crazy suit in the cape, smashing a car off a rock in full colour. You know, remember movies didn't have colour in those days and people listened to radio. The idea of a full colour entertainment experience was very new. It was as new as DVDs back then, a comic book, and that's why they were po probably so popular. But nothing like him had ever been seen before. And and that that cover has so much meaning in it because of the time it was made. And, and it was the time of the Depression, and the Depression was brought about partly by industrialisation and mechanisation replacing people's jobs with, you know, with machines. And the Chaplin movies were about that. Modern Times was about the little man fighting back against the all-powerful machine. And a lot of the stories of that time have these, you know, towering cities and cogwheels and all. So it, it was amazing to see Superman was a, a human fighting back. You know, he was, he was one of us, even though he wore this crazy cape. He was us at our best, fighting back and asserting the, the kind of individual over the machine again. By us of our collective imagination. Could it be that a culture starved of optimistic images of its own future has turned to the primary source in search of utopian role models? Could the superhero in his cape and skin tight suit be the best current representation of something we all might become if we allow ourselves to feel worthy of a tomorrow where our best qualities are strong enough to overcome the destructive impulses that seek to undo the human project? Yeah, I mean, sure. It's, I mean, honestly, it's not my theory. I don't want to lay claim to it because the guy who came up with it said uh, it was very smart. But uh, the theory was it was called the Sekhmet theory, I believe, and it was created by this uh, guy called Ian Spence, another Scot, you know. But I discovered it in in the nineties, and it talks about how uh, the sun changes its its magnetic polarity on a twenty two year cycle with the eleven year maximums and minimums. And he talked about the, the maximums having different qualities from the minimums because the polarity is changing completely. And he said that you can track the effect of this through the minds of particularly young people who respond to it very easily because they, they, they've not got used to it. You know, they, it's, For them, it's the first time. They've never felt this shift in polarity before. So the, his notion was that culture itself, as, as tracked by young people, particularly in the culture they made and the culture they consumed, could tell us how the sunspots were changing, you know. So he said that one pole was this punk and the other pole was hippie. And by punk he meant short clothes, uh, short hair, tight clothes, angry, fast songs, amphetamine use, uh, you know, black comedy, all those kind of tight, you know, values, this is sharp, tight, angry stuff. On the other complete opposite of that was hippie. So that's the baggy, you know, the long hair, beards, baggy clothes, long form music, psychedelic drugs, you know, more peace and love, more expansive. And that goes into the, you know, comedy's more surreal at those times. The comic books have gone through a surreal period. Everything kind of tracks it. And these things swing, you know, so they, they cross over as well. The streams are always there. One never goes away, but some become more popular. And, and it's, it's kind of a fun theory. Because when you do, you apply it to, say, 1955, the first appearance of teen culture, then that's during a punk maxima. So therefore, the clothes are tight, you have Elvis, it's, you know, rebellion, jailhouse rock, JD, kind of that aggressiveness. The, the, the drugs were either pills, like the Beatles were popping in Hamburg, or, you know, coffee started to become popular. 
But then you run this 11 years again, you get 1966, suddenly they're wearing caftans and beards start to appear and the music becomes free form, the drugs become psychedelic rather than stimulants. 1977, the drugs go back to being stimulants, glue and uh, speed again. You have the punks with tight clothes, the angry short fast songs, <laughs> the short hair. Speed, I got in 1988 in Britain, we had, you know, the, the rave movement, everything became baggy, the music became kind of transcendental, the drug was ecstasy. In America, you had grunge, which was a kind of recapitulation of psychedelic stuff, but with this dark kind of whine to it, you know, but it's long hair came back, beards came back, things that hadn't been accepted for a long time. And then 1999, we got The Matrix, new metal, everything got tight again, sexy, shiny, vinyl, comedy got really dark again. Especially after 9-11, suddenly, you know, the authoritarian characters were our heroes. And now again, you're seeing it swing back to this kind of cosmic vibe, and you could see it begin in entertainment like Inception and like Avatar and those, you know, and suddenly the hippie film Alice in Wonderland is back. <laughs> <laughs> and you hear the word psychedelic being mentioned more and more often and, and when people are talking about current bands and comics and ideas. And you and it, I mean, it really yeah. is a really, whether it, you can prove it, Prove it or not, you know, but it's a model and it's really fun to bring out at parties because people start thinking, well, that doesn't tie in. No, that does tie in. And it's, it's, a, it's a good one. Flash seems the one for me, you know, just the, just the look of it. It just seems so sleek and streamlined and modern. And he, kinda, he wasn't a bulky like the Flash, so I was quite a good runner. And I could imagine I could grow up to be the Flash because there was no way I was going to be Superman or Batman. <laughs> And I like the boots, the boots were the, the best bit about them, those inch thick yellow treads, you know, just so perfect, the entire boot just the same matte yellow colour, I mean how cool is that? It's like he's running in fireman's boots. <laughs> <laughs> so no, he, he was sleek and he had, and he had those buttocks that Cameron Infantino drew and he's like, oh he looks really fit, you know, the guy's <laughs> And he let it all hang out, he didn't care. It was the most utterly streamlined, shameless male costume in comics. So, <laughs> him, I, he, he was pure modernity and fashion for me. I, I mean, he, could, he could run fast. I thought that would be the best power he could have, to run at the speed of light and do it around the world and, you know, and get chocolate from other countries. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was kind of took that I, I did this uh, John Lennon inspired song. What brought that on? It was Gerard Way and I were talking, and I'd, I'd uh, in the first issue of the Invisibles comic, the King Mob character summons John Lennon as if he's a god. So as I was saying last night, most of the stuff that's in the Invisibles was stuff that I did. So I kind of I did that ritual, and I, I tried to summon. I, I treated them as if he was a god, and you know I, I laid out my Beatles records in a circle. I sat in the circle with a guitar and the Paisley shot and Beetle Boots and I played Tomorrow Never Knows in a loop and I, I kind of did the chants that you would normally do for say a god or a demon but did it all for John Lennon you know I am John Lennon, you are John Lennon, you are the god John Lennon and I got the visualisation of this head you know this thing and it's not I mean it's not like it's not a ghost it's not any of that all you're doing in these rituals is you're squeezing everything out of the atmosphere that isn't Lennon -ness. And I'm sitting with a guitar, so I'm just, there's nothing but Lenin. Everything else, there's no other feelings but pure Lenin in this room. And that's all it is. It's like a meditation to the point where this thing becomes like this visible head. And so basically, I was, I was talking to Gerard, and I said, look, when this happened, when it was, a, when it was all over, I'm singing and, and recording the, the event, and I got a song, and it was this it was kind of John Lennon pastiche song. So I, I, he said, oh, you got to play the song. And he bought me this guitar, this actual Lennon Epiphone <laughs> guitar. Okay. So last night I, I sang the song for the first time. And I, you know, I, I saw it on YouTube. It's like John Lennon's ghost. No, it's not a ghost. It's the spirit of John Lennon. <laughs> and, um, all I wanted to be. All I wanted to be. Was a beetle like you, John Lennon like you, John Lennon like, John Lennon like, John Lennon like, John Lennon like you, John Lennon like you, oh John Lennon like you.
can we talk a little bit about Superman? And then yeah, sure. You, yeah. I know you love Superman. Oh yeah, I, mean, um, I, I love Superman. Who doesn't love Superman exactly. except except, <laughs> except Lex Luthor? Can you give us a little bit of clues about? Superman, what you can do with him? Well, I mean, as I've said, he's, he's gone back, in my, in my version of it, to being the champion of the oppressed and the hero of the weak and the downtrodden. And he's kind of a little bit more human, I guess. He's, he's, the power levels are lower. Because, you know, I, I wanted to pay attention to what people had said, because with All-Star Superman, I just did this, my version of Superman, he's ultimately powerful, but that's not what's important. You know, the stories are about human emotions. It doesn't matter how powerful he is. It doesn't stop a good story because if the story becomes about how he can be hurt or affected by his heart, then it's a good story, whether he can throw sons around or not. But I know people always said they couldn't relate to Superman, they didn't understand the costume. So I thought, well, let's take all that seriously and do the comic for everyone who honestly said they, they couldn't deal with it. And of course, the, the funny thing was, so many people haven't even been reading Superman at all come out and how dare you change this, it's the worst thing that's ever happened. But that's everyone, <laughs> everyone will bitch about something. Yeah, so I mean, it, it's, it, but it was done, for this, I mean, this was me actually thinking about the, the, the objections people had to Superman in the modern world, why does he look, he looks stupid, you know, so I thought let's make him look like that, but in a way that you might understand, he's a farm boy, he's just his he's jeans, yeah, he's got jeans and a t-shirt on, he's had the t-shirt made up to have the sign from his cape, you know, and the... So the cape's the only item he's got from the planet Krypton. It was found with him. It was a baby blanket. So I had this idea that I thought was really nice. You know, you could tell Superboy's stories in the sense that he, he always had this cape. And even when he didn't have his powers, before he developed, the cape always protected him because it's indestructible. And it was his best friend. <laughs> and I think, so I kind of wanted to just add to all the items in the mythology and make them feel important again and meaningful. And to strip back those roots to what, what is Superman about? Well, he, it's, he's a depression hero and we're kind of in a different kind of depression. But let's do a Superman who's right down here with us and he can get bloodied up and he, he's messed up. He still doesn't stop and he, he doesn't care about the law. It's, he cares about justice. So it's very much it's that guy. You know, and it's, it's still the same. To me, it's the same guy who grew up to be All-Star Superman, really. But this was him when he was young and crusading. And Clark Kent too is, is a, a radical journalist, you know, he's a crusading journalist, he helps people, he saves lives, he's like, he's really good and he's this sort of much younger version who's a, a firebrand, you know, and he, he gets beat up all the time helping people. <laughs> I love that you put him back to basics on the mm -hmm. costume, I thought that was really interesting. You know, and also what we're doing, I mean, the story I'm telling is how he got the, 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 the Jim Lee redesign of the costume, so I want to integrate it and if we're going to have these different looks then to at least give them in story reasons and to make some kind of emotional story and meaning out of them so that he's not just wearing it because it looks cool, you know, he's wearing it for very specific reasons that are all about who he is. Yeah, I keep saying I'm, I'm, I just I like comics, you know, I can even quite understand. Yeah, I'm still doing Batman. I'm, I'm, there's another uh, couple of issues of Batman Incorporated first season to come out, you know, slowly, but they're coming out. Then uh, Chris Burnham and I are doing 12 issues of Batman Leviathan and that's my final chapter of the Batman story and it's the biggest Batman story I could come up with. So no, this is the, everything, this blows away everything, this is going to be really... Uh, Bigger than an R.I.P.? Yeah, this is a much more, this is like Shakespearean kind of, I'd like to think, you know, we're trying to make it really big and we're changing the way that we do the storytelling and all kinds of stuff because Chris is such a brilliant artist and, you know, so I'm going to give him a lot of the work. It's a big, big time tribute for me. But I was thinking about the idea of the gods and Kirby's new gods and what can I do that was new gods. <laughs> and again, that's like I said tonight, thinking of the old gods, what it might really be, it's ideas, powerful ideas. So taking Kirby's original notions and thinking what would what if they were set free from the bodies that he'd given them and just given free reign as ideas. So he created the greatest master villain of all time, Dark Side, you know, the cosmic tyrant. And it was the notion of dark side unfettered, and instead of a, a monster body, which is usually portrayed, but the idea of dark side grew in everyone's heads, and that became the threat to humanity. And that's what the superheroes are fighting against: is the the darkness inside, which has now been taken over by an actual malignant intelligence and is working everyone to its own will. And it doesn't have a body; you know, everyone it touches becomes its body. So I thought that was a kind of interesting giant dragon for a final story. And that was what it was about, it was about the DC universe up against the, the last dragon. This time. 
And going <clears> back to Final Crisis, it was a love letter to Jack Kirby, pretty much, right? Yeah, a love letter to Jack Kirby, but also to everything else, you know, to Len Wein and all those comics that I read when I was growing up. And it, but I wanted it to have the chaotic feeling of your first comic book. Because a long time readers sometimes forget and they think that, you know, no one wants to pick this up because they don't know who Dr. Fate is. And first comic I picked up had hundreds of these guys. I didn't know Wildcat, Dr. Midnight. All I knew was Batman and Superman. Right. And then you read it and you want to see the next one. You want to get more of these. You, you don't care if that guy's not named. He becomes your favourite because he's not named and you can pour all your fantasies and wonder who he is and how does he relate to them. So I kind of, I felt the comics were, had forgotten that, that they need that chaos. Sometimes things don't get explained. Some other writer will explain it really well somewhere down the line. And I tried to build that into Final Crisis, which, you know, I, I know a lot of people didn't care, but I think I, I really enjoyed it.